District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use, but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. We are rejoined by Andrew Poland to talk about one of the most interesting Virginia forms of hunting, hunting with dogs. This year in our General Assembly, from everything I've viewed so far, I think this is probably top of mind for Virginia hunters. There's a lot of debate around this, a lot of controversies, a lot of bills. Perhaps it's going to be inserted in an upcoming budget. But Andrew wanted to dive deep more into this, and I figured let's give him a platform to do it again. So, Andrew, thank you for coming back to District of Conservation. Thank you, Gabriella, for having me. It's good to have you on. I think you're one of the best people to articulate stuff on this issue because you are yourself a dog hunter. You see nuances. You understand the dynamics. You're affected by decisions that happen here. And and like we talked about last time, decisions of bad actors can ruin hunting, specifically for this variety of hunting, much like with other types of hunting. So for those who weren't familiar with your past appearance here, why is dog hunting such a big part of Virginia's hunting culture? Like what makes people so excited about it and, and keeping this tradition alive? Well, there's... um. There's a lot of forms of dog hunting. There's, you know, mounted fox hunting. There's field trials um, with foxhounds, which are very different. There, in some of them are um, are in in pen, fox pens. There's rabbit hunting. There's upland bird hunting. There's duck hunting and goose hunting. You know, waterfowl. And then there's you know bear hunting. Um, a lot a lot west of the Blue Ridge, but um, it's becoming more popular in areas like where I live at in Fluvanna. Bear hunting is becoming, with hounds, is becoming more popular, and and they seek to expand that. And then, of course, the the primary focus is deer hunting um, when we we talk about this issue. And for me, and I think most people, it's just been a, a way that we grew up. We Everybody grew up with, um, and, and I, I've kind of changed course or direction a little bit because I grew up hunting with deer hounds. And then, you know, I had a lot of friends with the long leg beagles. Um, and then as things changed, you know, land was sold and there wasn't, there's more hunt clubs with less land. Um, you know, not people build houses on small tracts of land and just, you know, issues that arose over the years, I'd switch to bird dogs primarily because it's just, it's easier, um, to manage. And, um, I think it's, I think it doesn't create as many landowner hunter issues and and I can attest to the fact that I until this year I've never had I've never had to call a game warden, never had an issue. Um so I primarily hunt with I have Llewellyn setters and a German short hair pointer. Um but that doesn't mean I have friends that have hounds that are tone broken, that load themselves up. When they cut the lights on on the collars, they know the hunt's over, those dogs come back to the truck. Fox hunters, when they blow the horn, the hounds come to the truck or they come to the horses. I mean, it's 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 really dependent on the person and, and how involved they are with the dogs and how much they work with the dogs. And I'm sure we'll get more into that, but it's more of a like a culture thing. I, and I would say for a lot of us, it's and me in particular and the the guys that I hunt with. It, it doesn't matter if we kill a deer or a turkey or a bear or whatever we're hunting for that particular day. Um, if, if we have a good day, everybody's safe, the dogs are safe and we enjoy each other's company. Um, that's all, that's all that matters to us. And it's more or less just the camaraderie, I think. And you're obviously invested in this form of hunting and you had alluded to, this is the first time I think you said you had to call a game warden. Could you share with the listeners what happened to one of your dogs recently? If you're at Liberty to share. 
Yeah, so I had a couple incidents this year, and I've never had incidents like this before. And these are on properties that I've hunted in the past, properties we have permission to be on. Um, on one particular day, uh, late in the season, um, I was hunting with a, a group of friends gather this one gentleman's house. He manages his property and properties next to it all year long. They kill a few big bucks. And then towards the end of the season, he calls all of his buddies together. And it's probably 15 or 20 of us. And our goal is to shoot a bunch of does, doe control. And I bring my bird dogs over there and we normally kill, you know, 10 or 15 does. And on occasion, someone will kill a nice buck. And we've never had an issue. It's always been safe. Um, it is, it's literally the example of how, you know, folks get together towards the end of the season and, and pull land together and do these hunts to control the doe population. And um, on this particular hunt, the last, the last hunt of the day, a person decided that they were fed up with dog hunting. They didn't like dog hunting. They didn't like, the, literally said, I didn't like seeing all the orange hats. Um, said that if we wanted to hunt from tree stands, that was fine, but he just didn't like this form of hunting. And he walked in the middle. My, my German short hair pointer ran a doe. Um, nobody shot at it. And as I saw the doe running towards the property line, I toned my dog to come back. And she stopped, but she didn't come back, which is not normal. So as I approached the location, of course, I'm looking at my GPS to see where she is. I see this gentleman with his hand on her harness. And he's, and his, I guess he's, I guess he was taking her towards his property is what it looked like to me. So, I, of course, I take off running towards him, trying to stop him. And everybody's trying to stop him. And in and, and his mind... He just didn't like dog hunting, and he was going to take my German short hair pointer and walk away with it, dragging her by her harness. So then we're put in a position like, what do you do? How do you how do you get your dog back? Um, it's a, 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 a it's a, a situation where the majority of people have firearms because we're hunting, and you have a an, a a person that's um, you know irrational walking into the middle of a hunt literally trespassing on someone else's property and then taking my dog. So we ended up, um, it was very confrontational. Um, and then called, called the game warden. He got out there pretty quick and, uh, resolved everything. I got my dog back. Everything was, was good to go. But, um, the guy literally had no other reason to do it other than he didn't like dog hunting and didn't, didn't matter that it was on someone else's property. He was going to, stop what he was doing, walk into the middle of a hunt and grab a dog. So, and, and my dogs are so, so friendly. I mean, they're, they run around the house and, and spend time with my family and other people. I mean, my dogs will run up to you. So uh, it wasn't hard for him to catch her. He, she probably just walked up to him to get pet and he just snatched her by a collar or by her harness, excuse me. But the, luckily the game warden resolved that pretty quickly. And then the, um, I guess the, 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 the other issue on January 2nd, um, I was hunting uh, every year, same deal, folks, the local hunt club, Waterloo Hunt Club calls me to bring my bird dogs to a couple couple properties that they had. And we had hunted a little bit during the day and uh, before lunch, and we were going to go over to this place after lunch, and I'd done the same thing in years past. And uh, they <clears throat> took me and another gentleman, uh, actually a, a kid that wanted to wanted to learn how to make a deer drive with bird dogs. He wanted to get into the sport. So he walks way back with me um, to the far end of this, this huge cutover and everybody's kind of lining it up like you do an organized hunt. And as we started walking, um, I noticed on several occasions that my dog Pip, my, one of my setters was not, he was not running normally. Normally they run in large circles and they come and check in with me every few minutes and I follow them on my Garmin and he just was, pretty much paralleling me and looked like he was walking down a path or something. He just, he wasn't moving fast. And I just, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really take notice other than, you know, I called him a couple times and he, he didn't come quickly. And I just kept moving along because he was still kind of moving at my pace. And, um, as we uh, got into this Creek bottom, we jumped a number of deer and, uh, one of the deer stood up right in front of us and the young man that was with me, took a shot, killed the deer. And, um, we praised the other three other dogs I had with me, praised them. And I again noticed why is tip not, he hasn't checked in. He's still walking over here. And I, so I went to this 
<clears throat> we were like in a, an SMZ or a stream management zone where it was kind of open from the cutover. So I stepped in there where it was more open and I called for him and um, I could see him coming down the creek bed and he wasn't acting normal. And as he got closer to me, um, we knew that something wasn't right. And uh, you couldn't see anything on the outside that was wrong with him. So I laid him down and, um, and I ran my hands through his, through his fur and I found an entrance wound and an exit wound in front of his back legs. Very small, no blood at all. A uh, very, very small wound. Um, and I realized that he had been shot, but it didn't make any sense because none of the standards had shot. And he was, he was on the, uh, it would be the, the, the west side of the property, never crossed anybody's property line. I'm looking at the Garmin. None of this makes any sense. I asked everybody, hey, I think my dog's been shot, but I, it's definitely got two wounds that appears that way, but it's, he's not bleeding, and I didn't hear anybody else shoot. Nobody knew what to make of it, so, of course, we ended the hunt. Took us forever to get the dog out, got him to the vet. In fact, they he, they confirmed that he was shot, um, and we couldn't we didn't even hear a gunshot, so we didn't we didn't know could it have been a small caliber rifle, which the vet said it could have been. Um, we thought maybe it was a field point on an arrow, which she was doubtful, but maybe because we didn't hear anything. Um, anyways, we spent about ten thousand dollars in two days trying to save the dog, and unfortunately, he had to be put down. Um, and we discovered that court when they were doing surgery that it definitely was a a small projectile, very small projectile, and um and it didn't do it didn't expand inside of his abdomen like a hollow point would it was so whatever it was was a, a solid projectile that did not that it didn't mushroom out or expand or or um or fall apart like a lot of bullets would, so we were kind of confused by what what had happened and how it happened. And then truthfully, like a lot of people do when they get in trouble, they tell them themselves. And I can't go too much into detail because I don't want to ruin the investigation. But um, someone that doesn't like dog hunting and had uh, prior issues, not just this year, but years prior, um, decided to take a shot. At, I don't know that he realized he shot the dog or if he shot in the general area. I don't know all the details. I, mean, I might never will. But um Sounds like it was probably an air rifle, one of those um, high-end air rifles that you can hunt large game with, and uh, unfortunately killed my dog. So that's, uh, and I will say in both incidents, the DWR, the the, uh, the police, the CPOs, or the game wardens, they did a fantastic job. Um, I gave my my Garmin and my collar to the to the CPO um, the next morning. And he was able to literally hook it up to his computer, track the dog's path. He could determine how fast the dog was traveling at different times of the hunt um, and pretty much pinpoint the area where everything changed based on his speed. And this is where we could determine this is the area that he was shot in. This is where he was relative to the property line. Um, that's the suspect property. This is the distance away from it that we were. I mean, they, they did a fantastic job and they still are doing a great job. I have nothing but good things to say about him. And, uh, unfortunately those were our, those were our two incidents. That's absolutely heart wrenching. I saw the update and I felt very bad for you. And I know how hard it is to lose a dog, especially under that circumstance. And anyone who's listened to you or, or knows you or follows you or heard you here on this podcast, you are very, very particular about respecting property rights. So I don't expect your dogs to go aimless. And, and like you said, in this recounting of the incident that your dogs are staying within the property lines, they were not going Anywhere, it was just these very aggrieved people who don't like dog hunters. They wanted to essentially, you know, air out their grievances, which is crazy. It has to be on both sides. As you talked about before, there has to be kind of a calmness um, from people who hunt with dogs and are extremists. And then, you know, people who have other extreme views, too, and don't like them and want to take matters into their own hand, even outside the confines of their property. And yes, the CPOs have been very busy. You probably saw that they also were able to quickly and sif swiftly uh, prosecute the guy who killed and poached the Hollywood buck. So yes, our CPOs here in Virginia do a great job, and I hope they're helping you with your case too, Andrew. And do you think that this these tragic, especially the, the more recent tragic incident and then the, the previous encounter too, now that you've had two encounters where you've had to um, seek the help of DWR CPOs, do you think this is now 
compelling you to be more involved in the legislative side here? Because you said that there are several pieces of legislation, this general assembly session to perhaps clarify or to help to perhaps, um, offer some more assurances to prevent this type of stuff from happening and making sure that everyone, every stakeholder uh, understands what's going on here all the while protecting hunting with dogs. Well, I don't think that, I, I think in both cases in my, is my situation. And then looking at the other cases of dogs that, have, that were unfortunately shot in Virginia, literally on the same day and the day before or after, I mean, there was a bunch of dogs shot in Virginia during the same time frame. Um, we didn't want ours on the news. We didn't, we didn't publicize it very much, so a lot of people aren't, probably aren't familiar with mine as much as they are the other ones. But I don't think that, you know, you can't, you can't control these, the, the extreme folks with laws. I mean, you, you just can't legislate morality. Um, so I think crazy people, and it's not just dog hunting, every issue that we have in the world, there's always extremism on both sides, right? Um, the problem I see with it is in the past two years, there have been groups, um, and they, and just like, just like political campaigns, they really have learned how to focus on social media. And, uh, one in particular, um, the Virginia rights, Coal Virginia property rights coalition, they have become like the Antifa of this issue. They, they have really pushed people to extremism. And after, after my particular issue, I spent hours on social media kind of tracking some of these folks once I had some names of people I thought were at fault and and I didn't realize that there's people taking pictures of me and other hunters just driving down the road and and literally I, I, uh, there's a photo of me two days before my dog was shot that says game on uh, more to more to follow that was uh two days before my dog was shot someone in my area posted that on Facebook just a picture of me driving down the state highway um, and there's not just me, there's other hunters too. So it's kind of hard for me to think that I wasn't, that I wasn't targeted, but this, but they're, that they're getting their information from this, this group and primarily on social media, like I said, and you can go in there now and see where these folks are, are now infiltrating like the community pages, like where I live at the Kent store community page, or maybe the, the Goochland community page, or, you know, every community has like a Facebook group that people talk about missing pets or things that are for sale or whatever. And they're getting in there and posting a lot of times anonymously pictures of, of dogs that, have, that are emaciated and have, and have passed away. And most recently, this one just happened um, a couple days ago locally. And it's a picture they took off of Google. And they anonymously post that this hunting dog came on my property and died. And well, none of it's true, but it's, it's grabbing people's attention is kind of sensationalizing the issue. It doesn't ha you know for them it's anonymous. Doesn't have to be true. They can post it, and it just it fires people up that, and literally over something that never happened, uh, or didn't happen here at least. So there's there's groups like that that are just extreme, and they don't they don't want to see hunting with dogs continue. They 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 mask themselves as a property rights group. But in fact, they do not want to see hunting with dogs continue, period. There's another group, the Virginia Property Rights Alliance. They're very professional. They're statesmen. I like the way they conduct themselves. They have an acute issue. They don't want to see the end of dog hunting. They don't want to see the end of hunting, um, regardless of how you hunt. They have an acute issue with primarily hounds, um, and they live in areas where hound hunting is very popular. And they have hounds running across their property, and they don't want that. If I, I mean, knowing some of their cases, their their, their situations, and, and being a property owner myself, if I was dealing with that, I would feel the same way. And one one individual that I've become friends with, I think he had hounds on his property twenty four days last hunting season. It wasn't one or two days, and it wasn't a neighbor that said, "Hey, man, I'm so sorry, my hounds got out, got out of the hunt." Um, we'll catch them real fast and be out of your hair. It was, oh, it's almost intentional, you know, 24 days. So if, again, if I put myself in his shoes, I sympathize with him because if I had hounds on my property 24 times during hunting season and, you know, without permission and people were up and down my driveway, I would be upset too. So there's two different groups, I think, that are really pushing the legislation. One of them, I, I, I really have come to like and, and try to understand. And the other group, um, I don't have 
I don't think we should negotiate with because in my mind, again, they're, they're like the Antifa of this issue. They, they're in your face. They're on social media. They're calling, they literally called my employer actually. Wow. Um, yeah. So the, they're, they are over the top. Most of them aren't from here. They moved here and they want the way of life they had primarily in Northern states. They want it here in Virginia. They don't like the dogs and uh, you're not going to change their mind. They are not going to, they're not going to um, try to find consensus. So my opinion is ignore them, focus on the alliance where they're very reasonable. And um, I think that um, I think their approach to this is, is, is a, is a much better one. And I think they're really trying to find some kind of consensus where we can pr- protect the property rights of everybody, which again, as a, as a conservative, we have to recognize that the, the right to property is paramount here. And it's, and, and I, I know hunters don't like to hear this, but dog hunters don't like to hear this, but the, their right to property is, uh, is obviously more important than our right to dog hunt. Right. So we have to find a way to, uh, to, to respect them and to still be able to do our sport. And so I think there's a way, I think there's a way forward. Um, I just think it's going to, I don't know that legislation is the right way. Um, but it, that seems to be the way we're going. I'm, I don't want, I don't, I, I've never had these issues before. So I, I hate that I have to, I might have to buy a permit or there may be another law, but at the end of the day, I don't, as long as we can continue to do it, I'll, fo- I'll continue to follow all the rules. I'll follow all the laws. I'll follow all the best practices. Um, and as long as we can continue to do our sport, things like, um, like minimum acreage and stuff like that would be de- would, would would destroy the sport. So I hope I, we don't see anything like that. And we, we haven't this year. Hope we don't see that in the future. Um, but what we're looking at this year is maybe a permit. I'm I'm honestly uh, not opposed to the permit. I don't like that it's um, in the budget amendment. I, I don't like I don't like the legislative process through the budget. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. But at the end of the day, um, if it is what it is, and I'm not opposed to the permit. Um, versus the regulation. And um, I can go into detail about why if you'd like, but that's kind of where I'm, where I've fallen on the issue. Yeah, go more into detail if you can. So, it, you know, there's a, again, I, I don't think a lot of these issues come down to people just not being good neighbors. Um, and, 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 you know, somebody bought a piece of property uh, or a parcel that was hunted for years and the hunt, you know, maybe there's a hunt club that's not respecting the property lines or they hunted it for years prior and they just can't work out an agreement. And then, and then in some cases just, there's just people that don't want dog hunting and there doesn't matter what you do to try to try to get along with them. It's just not going to work. And, um, I, so I don't, and, and we all know that, you know, 90, 95% of the hunters that hunt with dogs are not, are not guilty of any of these things. um, you know, I, I've, I have never in the group that I hunt with, we have, we would never cast a dog on a p- property that we don't have permission to be on. Um, we would never cast our dogs on property that we did have permission to be on with the intent of hunting property that we didn't like those things just never have crossed our mind. Um, but there are people that do things like that and there's got to be a way to punish them. And to stop them from doing that, because not only are they disrespectful to the landowners, they're also disrespectful to our sport. And as houndsmen, we sh- we we do try to police our own. I I know for a fact. I see it all the time during hunting season and outside of hunting season. Hunters really are p- doing a a good job of policing our own, but we can't you know we can't provide punitive consequences. So, um, the permit um, system to me seem to be the best the best way forward in my mind and, and the way that I would the way that I think would be best to go about it would be to issue a permit or a stamp just like we have a, a stamp for everything else. You know, if you want to cast your dogs, you're a dog hunter, you pay for this stamp. And like so many other things in conservation, uh, um, you know, the hunter's money goes directly towards problem solving. Goes maybe it goes towards more CPOs, which we all agree we need. Maybe it goes towards research and it goes, you know, goes towards other things because DWR is, is, is grossly underfunded and they, they get their money from when we buy ammunition, when we, when we buy permits, when we buy licenses. Um, so they desperately need those funds. 
So I'm not opposed to that. And the, the other thing about a permit that I like is that it's not, it doesn't jump right to legal consequences. For example, um, game warden find, you know, finds that you've been casting your dogs on somebody's property that you're not supposed to. It doesn't rise to the level of the current law because there is law on the books that says you cannot cast your dogs onto someone's property without permission. The problem is how do you prove that? You have to have a way to prove it. You have to catch them in the act almost. So in this, you know, if, if you do that quite a few times and, and, and the game warden can, can demonstrate that you're negligent and can, and can pull your permit, well, maybe, maybe you can still hunt, but you just can't hunt with dogs. And then after, you know, maybe it's a two week period or a month period. I don't know what the period of time is that they pull your permit for, but if you get caught hunting with dogs during that period, well, now you don't have the permit. Just like if you got caught hunting a deer without a hunting license, or if you got caught hunting, you killed a bear without a bear tag, then the consequences would be the same. Um, some people want the regulation, but I, the regulation, um, and DWR has the ability to regulate this now. I just feel like that goes directly to, you know, mis- class three misdemeanor. I don't think we want to, I don't think we want to criminalize this or at least as little as possible. Um, I think you want to change the behavior, not create criminals. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I'm in favor of the permit. I think if we don't do something to help these landowners, then they're going to continue coming back and, until finally, you know, the General Assembly is not, it's right on the verge of not, uh, not being favored towards uh, rural Virginia now. Um, and, you know, two more years, we could have a, a more left leaning General anti-hunting Assembly. Anti hunting General Assembly. And, and, yeah, heaven and, forbid. And, and anti hunting. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I think it's best that we leave this out of the hand of legislators. Leave it to the DWR. Leave it to to the hunters who've made these recommendations. And I know there's 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 people listening right now that are angry. I can't believe Andrew said he's in favor of a permit. I don't want a permit. I'm just trying to think of how to protect the sport for the next you know two or three decades. How to protect the landowners. How the folks like myself that do it legally can continue doing it without having these interactions. Um, and and again. If I put myself in their shoes, I have, I'm sitting on my 75 acre farm right now. If I had hounds running through here all hunting season, 24 consecutive times, you, we all have to admit that's not fair to that landowner. You're not, you know, it's not respectful. Um, you, you got to address it somehow. And it, he's not the only one. I mean, there's, there's tons of people I know that have dealt with that issue and we got to address it as hunters. Just like I said earlier, we've, we've addressed issues of conservation head on with our own funds. We've saved the turkey population, the bear population, the deer, you know, just name the things that, that hunters have, have done to protect our sport and, and, and really protect the environment. And this is, to me, is just another one of those things that we have to work on in Virginia. Absolutely. And engagement is really key. We have a great Department of Wildlife Resources and other allies who can help us um, there. So, Andrew, anything else you want to add as we round out the conversation? Yeah, I would just say... You know, every, everybody's got to tone it down. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of extremism that we're reading on social media. But throughout the year, and I served on the, the um, committee, the, the hound hunting committee, um, and I would come back from those meetings. And every time I, I came back and hunted with the folks that I hunt with, I would ask them, what's your opinion on this or that? And every single one I spoke to said, I don't want a permit, but I'll do it. If it raises money for more CPOs, if it if it gives the, the, them the ability to retain the the ones they have now, to recruit new ones, you know they they're underpaid, grossly underpaid now compared to state troopers. Um, if it, if it brings better quality law enforcement, more training, um, and then it protects our sport, we'll do it because for us. We're already following the best practices. We're following the law. We're, we're not doing anything now that is going to keep us from hunting in the future as long as we don't allow legislators to simply stop dog hunting. So just I know it, it sounds like a, a bridge too far for a lot of people, um, but for, unfortunately, Virginia has changed a lot, and um, we have to recognize that. And I'd also say, you know, I know guys, I'm, I'm, I got a guy right down the road from me who has the most well-behaved hounds you'll ever see. These dogs 
are tone broke, load themselves up. They do everything he asks them to do. I know a lot of fox hunters the same way. If you have dogs, it is incumbent upon you, if you call yourself a houndsman, to work with those dogs, to tone break those dogs, to get them to the point where they will, you, that you can catch them easily, you can load them up in the box and get on to the next hunt rather than running all over people's property or, um, you know, it just if, if we can stop that, um, then that would solve so many problems. The issues of, you know, they're, they're, dog hunting is a very visual thing. So people are always going to complain, you know, there's orange hats on the side of the road. They don't know that they're trying to stop their dogs from getting in the road, you know, or there's, there's the guy on the side of the road, with the, you know, he's 50 feet off the road with the shotgun. Well, it's, it's, he's, he's hunting and he's shooting away from the road into the hunt. That's the safest, the safest way to conduct our hunt. Or there's one bill right now that says you, you can't cast, you wouldn't be able to cast your dogs from the road. Well, I don't think anybody would agree that you should stop in the middle of a, a state highway and turn your dogs loose. It's unsafe. And I don't know anybody that would do that, but I do back my truck in from the road, face the tailgate into the hunt because I want my dogs to go away from the road. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm casting my dogs away from the road. I would never drive into a piece of property and cast them back towards the road. That's, that's asking for trouble. So I don't. I think there's a there's a fundamental misunderstanding on a lot of issues here that we have to work with folks like the Virginia Property Rights Alliance, um, who are willing to sit down and listen and try to understand your position. And every every I'll give you an example. They they didn't understand um, fox hunting. And they said, one of the gentlemen said, well, "Why on earth do you fox hunt at night? Because you can't you can't shoot a, a running fox at night. Who does that?" And we explained to them, well, nobody's shooting a running fox at night. That's tradition. You know, guys are sleeping out next to the campfire and listen to the hounds run. Hopefully they're chasing the gray fox. And that's just, it's just tradition. There's nothing more than that. Nobody's out there actually shooting these foxes. And they, they just didn't know. So having these conversations is paramount. Um, and it's, it's the conversations I've had with them have, been, have gone really well. And if we can all just give a little bit, I think, I'm looking at my daughter. She's 13. Hopefully for the next, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years, we'll be able to continue hunting like this. And, and then, um, again, as Virginia changes and more people move here and the, the, you know, folks from the city are moving out here and I live in an area that's very un, un, undeveloped and it's, you know, the more you drive down the road and, and see these small rural cluster subdivisions popping up, the more you got to think as a, as a hunter, how do I need to change to protect the sport and also protect those people who don't probably understand the way that we hunt? So, but I, I appreciate your your interest in the issue and and your involvement and and willingness to help and listen. Absolutely, yes. Anytime you want to come back and chime in on these issues, more than welcome to. And I think it's important because I live here. I'm adjusting to Virginia. I've I've lived here for over a decade, and you know this rural urban divide is a problem everywhere, including here in Virginia. So I appreciate your perspective, appreciate your involvement in this issue. And I hope you come back on and uh, I hope uh, the case against the gentleman who um, killed your dog, I hope it goes in your favor. Um, I'm confident that everything will work out the way it's supposed to. And hopefully you'll, um, uh, you were, we were supposed to get you and your dad down here to hunt this year. And actually after my dog was shot, I didn't do any more hunting. So, um, Next year, things will be a little different. Um, we'll, have, we'll have moved on, and uh, we'll be back at it, Lord willing, and I'll get you and your dad down here for a couple hunts, and hopefully uh, maybe we'll kill a spring turkey this spring if you guys want to come. We'll come for uh, turkey. Um, we'll come for deer, deer. Absolutely. No, whatever you want to do, and we'd be more than happy to tag along, and I would love to film it and catalog it, too. I think it would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Appreciate you again, and, and thank you for everything. Anytime, please come back if you have any more updates related to this, Andrew, and, and thank you for, for speaking out on this. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go leave us some reviews on Apple and Spotify or wherever podcasts are played. Your feedback will help us reach more people, and I love to know what is on your mind after each episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat or a guest announcement because that is our way of updating all of you listeners, and we have just hit 1,000 followers on instagram for the podcast account thank you very much and if you have any guest suggestions or topics you want to hear on the show i'm all ears i would love to hear your feedback there thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode